Uh, I'm very happy today to talk about therapy of juvenile dermatomyositis, past, present, and emerging. So a lot of ground for us to cover together. Um, let's see, how do I advance this? Okay, there we go. Okay, and these are my disclosures, including research funding uh, and unpaid advisory board memberships. So our overview of therapy is that we really lack controlled trial data for most of the therapies that we use and that we do most things by anecdote and custom. That being said, corticosteroids have been our primary therapy, but now we have the addition of other medications even at diagnosis. We have still limited data to suggest that methotrexate, azathioprine, IVIG, mycophenolate and cyclosporin have similar response rates in refractory patients. There are several new biologics and targeted drug therapies that are emerging and promising that we'll speak about today. And you heard from Amy Peller this morning about the treatment of skin disease, including photoprotection, topical steroids, and tacrolimus and hydroxychloroquine as very important adjunctive therapies for JDM patients. And we just heard from Brian about the importance of rehabilitation and physical therapy, that exercise is likely a very important component as well. Um, and uh, we need to apply that as well in our patients. So prior to the use of corticosteroids uh, in the mid-1950s when they really started, outcomes were extremely poor. As you heard from Anne earlier in the day, one-third of patients died and one-third survived with severe disability and often were wheelchair bound or had extensive calcinosis, uh, leaving only about one third that recovered. Well, historically, we've used high dose steroids on a daily basis, daily oral prednisone, and way back started with 18 or 24 months of treatment. These steroids have been life saving. They're the one medicine that's truly changed the outcome of these patients, and mortality is now under 1% as a result. Uh, from Sue Boyer's work many decades ago, we also saw that earlier introduction of steroids and in higher dose uh, resulted in patients having less calcinosis or fewer patients developing calcinosis. So that was another important aspect as well. And less of a chronic disease course and less disability. But as you also know, steroids have many intolerable side effects from uh, personality changes, weight gain, GI distress, all the features of Cushing syndrome, and longer term cataracts, growth failure, and metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular sequelae. So this really, in the end, is not the full answer for us, and we need to find alternative strategies. Well, uh, we have seen then that people are introducing other medicines earlier uh, from our retrospective review of uh, several hundred patients in our registry studies Takuki Kishi has shown that patients treated with these other treatments, which really started back in the late 1990s, are getting down to lower doses of prednisone much sooner uh, than patients who were treated before that time period. And Brian Feldman in his clinics really looked at the early introduction of methotrexate right at the time of diagnosis as compared to people who never received it. And he was able to show that patients could discontinue uh, prednisone much earlier at 10 months as opposed to those uh, who received only prednisone who discontinued on average at 27 months after diagnosis. He also showed in his study uh, half the cumulative steroid exposure in the people who received methotrexate right from the beginning, and importantly, uh, less steroid side effects, including uh, better weight gain, uh, less cataracts, and better growth velocity. So Kara went on to uh, develop a consensus treatment plans. Uh, really, these are the approaches now that people are using to treat moderate patients or patients that with at least moderate or severe disease. Everybody then is started on prednisone with methotrexate right from the get-go. And then there is option to pulse patients with high-dose methylprednisolone. And this is perhaps based on Lauren's work with Kelly. Uh, showing a decreased absorption of oral prednisone and the need to uh, uh, give pulse steroid at the beginning as well. And some patients then would have the option of adding in IVIG, and pe uh, pediatric rheumatologists would pick one of these three treatment options uh, to start their patients on treatment. 
Caro also realized then that we should be taking people off treatment more quickly and uh, of prednisone, and they developed a, a standardized tapering regimen to taper down patients within uh, 46 weeks if people were improving on therapy. Uh, the Printo group uh, went on then to do an international trial looking at the combination of prednisone as compared to prednisone with methotrexate or cyclosporin. It was a randomized trial in an open fashion. Uh, they were able, though, to show in this trial that patients who received prednisone with cyclosporin or methotrexate responded better at six months compared to patients receiving only prednisone. And these were by the old uh, response criteria, but they have been reworked with the new response criteria, and the data still holds. Um, in fact, patients also discontinued uh, a prednisone earlier if they had received methotrexate or cyclosporin, and they were more likely to enter clinical remission. And patients receiving methotrexate had fewer adverse events than those with cyclosporin, so the preferred therapy then is to combine with methotrexate. The Printo group just published uh, in the last month uh, a standardized tapering regimen for prednisone that would get people off even earlier at 18 months uh, out um, with a standardized tapering down of the prednisone. And then we have um, more limited data about IVIG, but our practice from the Delacus trial uh, published in the early 1990s in adult dermatomyositis is to use two gram per kilo per month. Uh, there are alternate regimens of a gram per kilo every two weeks or four weeks as well. Um, this can be used as the initial treatment for moderate to severe disease per the CARA uh, uh, consensus. The advantages of using IVIG would be that it is non-immunosuppressive, that it is short-acting, so it seems to work very quickly within one to three months, that it can be helpful for patients with severe weakness, dysphagia, ulceration, or even for a patient in an intensive care unit where there's concern about infection. And then Brian, again, had a very nice study uh, looking at uh, using marginal structural modeling to adjust for confounding by indication, showing us that patients uh, who were steroid resistant, that is that they failed to respond in six weeks to standard therapy, that they may respond better to IVIG than the steroid dependent patients or the ones who flare upon tapering their steroids. And he had given the IVIG out to two years, but interestingly sees continued improvement in the DAS scores beyond that, out to four years. Um, there are treatment-related side effects with IVIG, particularly the annoying side effect of aseptic meningitis with a lot of headache, can even be with nausea, vomiting. Um, Brian also had studies that showed that this was improved with low IgA and low sucrose, low osmolality products. And also, anecdotally, slowing the rate of infusion can also be helpful, even changing brands to these products particularly helpful. So then uh, we've gone over the first-line treatments for JDM. We, we've talked a little bit about adjunctive treatments, but we'll speak a little more later. So then what would we do if our patients aren't responding to these treatments? What could we introduce next? Well, there are a number of uh, drug therapies that are used commonly, including mycophenolate mofetil, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, azathioprine, uh, in more advanced cases, cyclophosphamide, which we'll speak about and then we'll talk about the use of rituximab that's come into foray. So we really only have case series and open label studies, primarily in adult patients, but a few in JDM patients with mycophenolate mofetil and tacrolimus. Uh, actually, Kelly and Lauren, again, had published a very nice case series in JDM patients. Uh, and all these really show that the majority of patients have improved in their strength enzymes and rashes had the ability to lower prednisone dose and improved or stabilized lung disease in the adult patients with these treatments. Um, it was Lucy Wedderburn's group led by Claire Deacon that uh, looked more closely at IV cyclophosphamide as a therapy for severe JDM, particularly patients with cutaneous vasculopathy or GI ulcer, CNS disease, and interstitial lung disease are perhaps the ones that we often try to use this therapy. And they studied 56 
severe treatment refractory patients. They gave a regimen of every two weeks uh, for three doses and then out monthly for six months. Um, they were able to show that there was improvement. Again, they used the marginal structural modeling to adjust for the confounding by indication and showed improvement in global activity as well as CMAS scores, muscle strength, and skin activity, and a lowering of prednisone dose. And interestingly, although they gave the therapy for six months, the effects were seen out even past 12 and 24 months. Um, and they only had minor adverse events, including two respiratory infections and one mouth ulcer, although pointed out that longer-term sequelae needed to be followed and, and watched for. So now we really want to move into the era of targeted therapy, and Anne so nicely outlined all the immune defects and abnormalities that we see in JDM, activation of B cells and T cells, uh, production of I interferon and other cytokines, and should we be targeting some of these pathways very specifically uh, and trying to uh, be uh, more targeted with our approaches. We we're fortunate then to have the rituximab trial, the NIH-funded uh, uh, trial that Ann led and with Chet Otis, a uh, multicenter trial. This was a very interesting design uh, 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 in which patients were randomized to see rituximab either at week zero one or at week eight nine. So a randomized placebo phase design modified, if you will, trying to see if patients who receive rituximab sooner would respond earlier to the treatment. That was the primary endpoint. The trial was disappointing in that uh, way in that the patients, primarily adult poly and dermatomyositis patients mixed in with the JDM patients, did not respond earlier for those who had received it earlier. Uh, but we look at the JDM curve very specifically we don't see a significant difference, but we see a separation in the curve. So the people who got rituximab early responded on average by 12 weeks, as opposed to those who got it late and responded on average by about 20 weeks. Um, so there's a suggestion, but it's not significant. There was a lot of other important data from this study, though, that enables us to use rituximab uh, in JDM patients. First, we saw that um, and an analysis that Rohit Agarwal did of the data saw that patients with JDM as opposed to adult DM and PM uh, and those with lower disease damage at baseline had a shorter time to response at week eight. And that there were certain autoantibody groups, including those with MI2 and JO1, and in this trial not identified, but a group called other autoantibodies that responded sooner than patients without an autoantibody. And then there were uh, responses uh, predicted by interferon gene scores and chemokine scores. So this was Anne's data that showed that, in fact, patients with a larger change in their interferon chemokine score, and it was the patients with these particular antibodies, uh, responded better to the treatment. Um, and then Nagaraja did a study with our group from the NIH who had muscle biopsies, the adult patients, and those patients who responded better had higher baseline interferon gene scores in the muscle and a greater reduction of the interferon signature in the muscle after rituximab therapy. And another piece of evidence that uh, suggested that the treatment worked is that eight of nine patients who were retreated and had flared later in the trial again responded to the treatment or met those criteria for definition of improvement. Uh, and side effects were uh, common, but not serious, typically. Uh, infusion reactions, some infections, and low blood counts. So now we could go on to some newer treatments that are being tried, and we have some data, uh, primarily from adult studies. I'd like to go into those new areas now. Uh, first is Abatacept, um, which has been tried in uh, uh, open-labeled study of moderately active uh, patients with adult dermato and polymyositis. Uh, this study has been led by Ingrid Lundberg. It was a randomized trial with a delayed start design uh, in which abatacep was given IV. So patients received it either at uh, week um, 
month zero or month three months later, and they were randomized. The patients who received a Batacept early then had responded uh, better using the new improvement criteria as it compared to, uh, I'm sorry, here, as opposed to patients who received it later. Uh, and so at month three, when the second group hadn't received it, there was a significant difference in the uh, total improvement score. And um, also by percentage, 60% uh, of patients receiving drug early as opposed to 20% receiving it later responded at month three. So um, Ingrid also showed that there was a decreased expression of uh, FOXP3 regulatory T cells in the muscle tissue, and these increased after six months of treatment. Uh, the adverse events, um, there were no serious adverse events, and the primary events were infection-related, including urinary tract infection, upper respiratory infection, and herpes zoster. So this trial then formed the basis for a very large randomized control trial that's underway now, uh, being led by BMS. Uh, and I will say that adult JDM patients are eligible for that trial. And then there's a small open label study in progress for JDM patients at the George Washington University Myositis Clinic. So two places that JDM patients could enroll and learn more about this medication. Another very promising uh, area and under study is um, the JAK kinase inhibitors, uh, based again on uh, the work that we heard this morning about the strong type 1 interferon signature in the blood and muscle of patients with JDM, um, and, and also in the skin, and that this correlates with disease activity, as Anne spoke this morning. So JAK kinase inhibitors then block the signaling pathway of, uh, of the interferon uh, response genes, uh, blocking the phosphorylation of stats, and then the generation of these interferon response genes and interferon production. So there have been several reports, actually now numbering more than 20, of substantial improvement in dermatomyositis activity in refractory patients. Most of the reports have focused on improvement in skin disease with only a few uh, focused on improvement in muscle or lung disease. These patients were treated with tofacitinib, baricitinib, or roxalitinib. Uh, there is a... Um, open study in progress at uh, Johns Hopkins University of tofacitinib for refractory dermatomyositis patients. Um, and then we should keep in mind that uh, the JAK kinase inhibitors don't just inhibit the interferon pathway, but in fact uh, block a number of different cytokines depending on which kinase they're inhibiting. Uh, so there are, there's quite an array of cytokines that are blocked, many of which are pathogenic in the disease. Um, and tofacitinib is currently approved for rheumatoid arthritis, baricitinib as well, and baricitinib has a pediatric dosing available uh, through the studies of Raphael Golbachmansky with Hannah Kim, mm -hmm. uh, who studied it for um, Savi uh, and Candle, uh, monogenic interferonopathies. So one of the uh, more interesting studies, I think, is the study published by the French group, a series of four patients. Interestingly, they had treated um, myotubes in vitro with roxalitinib. They showed a prevention of that with interferon uh, stimulation, these myotubes atrophy. And then if they pretreated the myotubes with roxalitinib, they prevent the atrophy of the myotubes. They similarly showed that uh, with interferon production, they had damage to endothelial cells uh, in the muscle tissue. And then with the pretreatment of roxalitinib, they were able to prevent that. Um, so then they used this um, in their patients and were able to show four patients with dermatomyositis who markedly improved in their skin activity following treatment with roxalitinib, decreased their interferon gene scores in the peripheral blood and the interferon alpha production as well. Um, Hannah herself has now led an interesting study in expand, part of the expanded access treatment protocol of baricitinib that was expanded to include juvenile dermatomyositis patients who were severe. Um, so four patients had enrolled in this open access program, 
uh, ranging in age from almost six to more than 20 years, who had disease for a while, and they were severe and treatment refractory patients. They had received multiple medications, including prednisone, IVIG, mycophenolate, mofetil, and at least one other medication. Uh, Hannah presented very early data from this study at the Global Conference on Myositis, uh, which she has uh, observed at 12 weeks follow-up in this study so far, is that uh, the primary endpoint and uh, overall diary score uh, improved significantly in these patients. Uh, this consists of um, musculoskeletal pain, weakness, fatigue, and rash. Uh, also, the uh, core set measures of activity, including uh, global extramuscular activity, muscle strength, and CDASI scores also improve in these patients from baseline assessment. The patient baricitinib was generally well tolerated with no um, serious adverse events and nobody discontinued uh, it so, to date, and um, she's hoping then to con not only continue follow-up on these patients, but even to start a new study on baricitinib, and she's planning that now. So another uh, new treatment that's coming along is one known as lena lenabasum, which is a synthetic cannabinoid receptor type 2 agonist that activates an anti-inflammatory pathway, an anti-fibrotic pathway. Um, these, uh, this cannabinoid receptor is expressed on activated immune cells like plasma cytoidendritic cells, T cells, myocytes, keratinocytes, and fibroblasts. And Vicki Wirth, uh, uh, who, who I'm grateful for this, these set of slides, uh, has shown in uh, treatment of I'm sorry, treatment of PBMCs and skin results in lowering production of uh, interferon and other inflammatory cytokines, a decrease of CD4 cells. And um, she also has shown in patients treated with lenabasm that um, she can see this as well in treated patients. Uh, so she did conduct an NIH-funded placebo-controlled randomized trial for skin-predominant dermatomyositis in adults. Patients were given half dose for one month and then two months of full dose and then came off drug for a month before going into an open label extension phase. Um, she had a significant improvement in the SIDASI score, the skin activity score. Uh, this is apparent at uh, week 10, but also at week, uh, week 16 after treatment. When the patients were taken off their treatment, uh, then she followed them along and uh, uh, followed them in the open label phase and continued to see improvement in CDASI out to week 68. Um, many patient reported outcomes were also improved in her trial, including skin symptoms, itch, pain, and she also showed increased physical function as well. She's presented these preliminary data at both the ACR and ULAR meetings. But this trial also then is the basis for a new study, a randomized controlled trial now enrolling patients with dermatomyositis, and again, JDM patients over 18 years of age may enroll. And they, uh, five centers are currently open, but quite a few centers are planned. They require moderate disease activity, including at least moderate disease in the skin and mild disease in the muscle, and they're comparing high dose versus low dose of drug to placebo in this new trial. Uh, we have a few studies about ACTH gel, and the primary reason I mentioned this treatment is because it's our only FDA-approved treatment for dermatomyositis, but based on very limited data. So there is now a long-acting formulation of HCTH, and it's thought to have other immunomodulatory properties through pro-opioid melanocortin peptides. Um, there have been two case series published of a small number of patients including one JDM patient uh, who improved in their strength, function, pain, and enzymes, but not as much in their skin disease. And there was thought that perhaps they had less steroid side effects, including uh, less weight gain, no hyperglycemia, and improvement in bone density in one patient. Rohit Agarwal went on to do a study in 10 adult dermato and polymyositis patients who were treatment refractory with moderate disease activity they received this treatment twice weekly for 24 weeks. 
and most patients then met the IMAX definition of improvement at eight weeks of response and continued to improve in their core set measures up to 24 weeks. Patients were able to decrease their prednisone dose quite a bit under with this new medication and half of them discontinued altogether. Uh, but they had a number of adverse events, many of which uh, seemingly are glucocorticoid related. Uh, they had some uh, herpes zoster, a vascular necrosis. Uh, they had hyperglycemia, hypertension, insomnia, anxiety, high lipids, although not severe Cushingoid features in these patients. Uh, there is currently an active trial open for dermatomyositis skin disease of ACTH therapy, and again, enrolling adults with JDM into the trial. It's a trial at Cleveland Clinic. And then finally, I think Lauren uh, has uh, envisioned for the future uh, a potential treatment uh, of a, a treatment that is a steroid but not a glucocorticoid. Um, and it's uh, different from prednisone in that an oxygen species has changed to hydrogen and there's an addition of a methyl group. Uh, so these structural changes to the molecule result in differences in binding to the glucocorticoid receptor. So there's uh, co-receptor binding is increased with more retention of anti-inflammatory activity and co-activator binding is decreased, potentially improving the safety. Um, there is preliminary data on this new medication in patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, the patients retain similar activity in improving their physical function as, as with prednisone but at least biomarkers of uh, safety were improved in the more alone treated patients. So they had less uh, biomarkers of mineral loss, less uh, uh, metabolic disturbance, and so forth. Uh, so we hope, but certainly we're in just very earliest planning stages that there might be a trial in the future in patients with dermatomyositis, particularly juvenile dermatomyositis. So there are a few other treatments under study right now for patients with dermatomyositis. Tozolizumab, IL-6 receptor monoclonal antibody is being studied in adult patients but open to enrollment for adults with JDM. Uh, Belimumab that Anne mentioned this morning blocks BAF uh, and is uh, under study in adult dermatomyositis. There's an anti-interferon and another uh, 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 it monoclonal that inhibits plasma cytoidendritic cells, uh, PDE4 inhibitor, and the anti IL-3 mono, IL-23 monoclonal antibody, all trials in adult dermatomyositis. So in the future, we may have more treatment options available, though certainly these will need to be tested in juvenile patients as well. We heard from Amy Peller this morning, so I won't go into it again, but the use of photoprotective measures and treatments for the itch. Uh, we heard about the care treatment consensus for skin predominant disease, but there's also a treatment uh, consensus about persistent rash uh, that patients failing prednisone and methotrexate should consider treatment with IVIG or mycophenolate mofetil or cyclosporin uh, as three treatment options. And then calcinosis has been an understudied area for treatment, and we had a very nice review from Amir Arandi about some treatments that have been tried, including uh, pimidronate, uh, calcium channel blockers, colchicine, and topical sodium thiosulfate. But certainly we don't have, uh, we only really have anecdotal reports and not consistent success with these various approaches. Uh, so we do have a uh, treatment trial underway at the NIH now, being led by Adam Schiffenbauer for IV sodium thiosulfate treatment for patients with moderate to severe calcinosis. It has several potential mechanisms in binding calcium, inhibiting cytokines and other inflammation pathways, altering blood vessel function, and serving as an antioxidant. Uh, so now this trial has just opened to patients that are children who are at least seven years of age, and JDM patients who are at least this age and adult age are eligible for this study. And we heard from Brian also about uh, patients having a decreased exercise capacity, uh, 
We know that exercise is safe. There have been a number of studies, both open and controlled studies, showing that exercise is safe to do. I think the interesting studies in, uh, have been the uh, adult studies led by Ingrid Lundberg, showing a decrease in inflammatory genes and an up, and, and up regulation of pro-fibrotic genes, I'm sorry, down regulation of pro-fibrotic genes after resistive exercise training. And then in a controlled study, she also showed uh, these changes again, but also improved mitochondrial biogenesis, improvement in capillary growth, and cytoskeletal remodeling uh, and, um, in, in her controlled exercise trial. So we've talked today about our treatments, that prednisone is the mainstay in the initial treatment of patients, that prednisone has a lot of toxicity, so we are using having a very early introduction of methotrexate and pulse methylprednisolone, and that's now a standardized part of our treatment of patients with JDM. We have available other immunosuppressive drugs and rituximab for treatment refractory patients, and we have new biologic therapies and dr targeted drug therapies where we have limited data and more trials ongoing, including abatacept, JAK kinase inhibitions, and lenab lenabasum. Uh, photo protection and treatment of skin disease are critical, and exercise therapy has anti-inflammatory and pro-energetic properties uh, that may be beneficial as well. I think our areas of gap in treatment include that we don't know if these new treatments will be effective for patients earlier in disease. We don't know if there are certain subgroups of patients that respond better to certain of these treatments and whether we need different treatments for skin as opposed to muscle disease. So these are important gaps for us to work on as well in the future. So I'd like to thank uh, many people for help with many of, much of our work through the years, including uh, our folks in our group at EAG, the GW Clinic, NIH, and other collaborators, including the IMAX and Rituximab collaborators and the Printo group as well. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. We have one, and that's thank you. <laughs> that was masterful. So Lisa, here we are. We've discovered that there are subgroups of JDM. We're trying to harmonize our observations as, with as many people as we can. And the variations in climate, diet, and genetics will alter, may alter some of their responses. How do we choose a group that's relatively homogeneous for comparing the various drugs? Mm -hmm. it's, a it's, a, it's tough, but I guess we really have to think through be, uh, if certain of these treatments will be more effective in certain groups, then we'll need to restrict our studies to them, but that may also limit us as to who we would prescribe them for. So um, on the other hand, we could be missing important signals of effect if we, all, if we study too many people and wash out people who are not responding. So we have to plan our studies carefully based on which treatment we're, under, we're studying. 